In, in a constantly evolving industry, you know, what trends do you do, do you see, you know, for changing and what, what, do you, what do you see for, you know, shaping the future of property management? You know, I think we are uh, in a in a situation today that, um, you know, the demand on, on housing is so significant. Um, you know, I think mm -hmm. migration coming into Calgary and Edmonton and Alberta at large, you know, puts tremendous pressure, um, you know, for all of those that have a role in developing housing. So, yeah. you know, I think from a property management standpoint, we just have to be ready. Uh, we have yeah. to ensure that, you know, we deliver um, the services that we need in a timely uh, manner for those residents and for, for those property owners, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, we, if property managers aren't equipped um, to service that type of demand, once the supply starts to continue to be built, you know, mm -hmm. I think, you know, it can have certainly an impact to, to the residents, which ultimately at the very end of it is who we serve, right? Welcome to the Mastering Property Management Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Sarbit. Join me as we delve into candid conversations with industry experts to uncover their strategies and insights for achieving success in property management. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, let's elevate your property management skills together. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mastering uh, Property Management. I'm Jared Sarbit. Today, I have the honor of having Glenn Manley on. He's the uh, president of First Service Residential here in Alberta, the largest residential property management company in Alberta. They have 225 communities that they service, over 25,000 doors, uh, and uh, an absolute amazing empire here in, in Alberta in the property management world. Uh, Glenn, thanks for coming on. Uh, and uh, first of all, I just want you to kind of go into your story. Tell me a little bit about, you know, where you started, some of the big milestones along the way, how you got into the property manager world, and then where you are today. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Jared. And uh, certainly appreciate you um, getting me on your podcast. It's uh, definitely my pleasure to uh, be speaking with you today. You know, um, my property management story, I got to tell you, it, uh, it wasn't like I came out of college or, or went into college and said, hey, what courses do I take to be a property manager? I think for most of us in the industry, for as long as we've been, you just kind of fall into it. And that's exactly kind of how I, how I started my story. Um, I was a resident manager, actually, in fact, for a mid-rise apartment building right here in Calgary on 17th Avenue. Um, broke, didn't know what to do with my life. And, uh, you know, it was an opportunity that, um, you know, at that time, uh, these opportunities still came in the form of, you know, being in a newspaper. Um, that's, you know, gives you a little bit of sense of how, how long ago that was. Um, but it was from everything from, you know, being a bit of a caretaker, doing some light maintenance, moving some people in, collecting rents, showing suites, kind of the whole gamut. Um, and then there, thereafter, you know, I think I, I, I kind of realized not at the time now that reflecting on it, that, you know, I, it, it was, it was very valuable for me, very rewarding to serve people and particularly, you know, arguably one of the most important things to their life, which is their homes. And, you know, from that kind of mindset and, and that, you know, feeling, um, I just continued to progress in my career, um, worked for several different REITs. Um, at one point, you know, it helped support the Calgary Homeless Foundation, um, internalizing property management um, as they kind of, you know, scaled and, and continued to get supports and, um, you know, funding and financial supports from, from, from all sorts of government to, to, to help support kind of their contingencies. And, and to kind of where I am today with first service residential. So, um, you know, proud to be a, a grassroots uh, property manager, if you will, um, yeah. and, and with uh, first service residential now. Amazing. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and so uh, what are some of the qualities that, that you think got you there? I mean, that's uh, like starting from, you know, really from, from you know, the ground up right yeah. um what, what would you attribute like what what characteristics did you have that, that got you to the position that you have that you're in today yeah you know i think there has to be a mindset of ownership and you, you certainly have to put yourself in the shoes of that building owner um mm -hmm. that this is yeah. this is your asset and 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 equally if not more important um understanding what your purpose is and so wow. i think when you, you 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 match that mindset but mindset of you know taking ownership of that asset whether it's you know, the cleanliness of it, you know, the landscaping of it, you know, make sure the units are, are in tip top shape and, and ensuring that when, when, when residents come home, that it's worry free and, and, and as much as possible, they've got responsive supports. But at the same time, knowing that that's your purpose, your purpose is to serve these uh, residents that, you know, they don't want to come home from life, uh, having to deal with a bunch of, 
you know, things that your manager or your building ownership should actually be dealing with. So, you know, I think those are the two most important things that I would say, um, mm. having that ownership mindset and knowing what your purpose is. Amazing. So do you think like along the way, you know, you, you just portraying that, giving that ownership mindset, you know, to your, to your tenants, uh, people recognize that you did that and it just automatically just started creating success and started moving up the ranks. Is that kind of the, yeah, I mean, I think the results will speak for itself. Yeah. When you embrace that ownership, when you yeah. walk up to that building and you yeah. see litter, you pick it up. It yeah. doesn't matter if you're an owner, if you're an asset manager or a property yeah. manager, you pick it up like it's your home. Yeah. Um, you know, when you see your neighbor, you greet them, you say hi. Yeah. Um, you know, if somebody calls you because they rely on you to get, you know, whatever work it is that they need done, that you're responsive and that you manage yeah. those expectations. So I think by embracing that mindset of ownership, you know, things materialize into positive results. And those positive yeah. results have afforded me the opportunity of, you know, moving forward and progressing into my career. Very cool. That's awesome. Uh, you know, property managers, you know, often deal with you know, various stakeholders, um, you know, from the, uh, from the tenants to the, to the owners, to the, you know, to the contractors and vendors that you deal with, you know, how do you ensure effective communication and foster positive relationships between all of these? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a good point. It's something that we um, definitely balance and juggle every single day. Right. Um, and I think you, you, you just kind of simplify it in managing everybody's expectations and that's through clear and open communication. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you, you sometimes have to deliver news that isn't the greatest for the recipient, but you gotta mm -hmm. be honest, you gotta be transparent, you gotta be clear. Um, yeah. you know, from, from, uh, serving an ownership standpoint or, or in our case, we serve a lot of board of directors, you know, mm -hmm. ensuring that what we say we get done and we continue yeah. to communicate with progress. And if there's a deviation to the plan, we, we tell them why, and we tell them how we're going to correct it. And so really it's, it's, it sounds simple. Sometimes it's a little bit more difficult in real life, but it's yeah. manage those expectations with clear, yeah. open, uh, timely and transparent communication. Yeah. Fantastic. Very good. Um, and then, you know, balancing cost effectiveness with, with property maintenance is crucial. You mm -hmm. know, how, how do you and your team prioritize upgrades and repairs, you know, to ensure long-term value for both the owners and the tenants? You know, um, that's a, that's a great question. I think a couple of things, a, we want to make sure that our goals of our clients, um, first and foremost are, are set and clear. And we, we mm -hmm. know, um, what they aspire and what their established goals are and what's attainable, what's realistic. And, you know, what are, what are kind of wish list items, if you sort of speak, right? right. Um, and second to that is making sure that we execute to what their expected guidelines are. Um, mm -hmm. And you combine that to, you know, what we can leverage in terms of our resources. Um, when we are afforded this opportunity of managing over 20,000 homes across Alberta, you know, there's, there's certainly um, scale there that we can leverage in terms of our resources with vendors and partnerships that we have. Um, to just get as competitive as we possibly can with whatever respect that, you know, capital maintenance costs or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, so understanding what the ownership goals are, you know, make sure that there's a realistic set of goals there and, and us to execute it in, 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 in their respective guidelines and then leveraging our resources and our partnerships to, um, you know, kind of get the best for your buck, so to speak. Good. No, that's, uh, that's, that's amazing. How many, how many property managers do you have on your team, by the way? On the condominium side, we have uh, 22, 23, 22. Uh, Calgary okay. and Edmonton. And then okay. on the um, rental side, because we have a rental division as well that services uh, multifamily pro uh, properties, right. we have uh, four property managers on that side. So 26 okay, in total. 26. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and do, you, um, do you have any commercial under your belt? Is there strictly residential? Um, we've got commercial to the extent of uh, commercial units being under a mixed use development. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, in, in a constantly evolving industry, you know, what trends do you, do, do you see, you know, for changing and what, what, do you, what do you see for, you know, shaping the future of property management? Well, you know, I think we are uh, in a, in a situation today that, um, you know, the demand on, on housing is so significant. Um, you know, I think mm -hmm. migration coming into Calgary and Edmonton and Alberta at large, you know, puts, tremendous pressure, um, you know, for all of those that have a role in developing housing. Yeah. So, you know, I think from a property management standpoint, we just have to be ready. Uh, we have yeah. to ensure that, you know, we deliver um, the services that we need in a timely 
uh, manner for those residents and for for those property owners, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, if if we if property managers aren't equipped um, to service that type of demand once the supply starts to continue to be built, you know, mm -hmm. I think you know it can have certainly an impact to to the residents, which ultimately at the very end of it is, is who we serve, right? Sure. Yeah. So when you say there's, you know, pressure on, on supply, how does that affect your property managers from a day to day? Like, is it on turnovers? Like, you know, if, if people are moving out and then you're flipping those quickly or where, where do you see that pressure? Yeah. I mean, on the rental side, right? Like, you know, gone are those days where you have, you know, a week or any type of gap between a move out and a move in. And so yeah. our back to our, our back to backs on that front, it's much more frequent. So the impact to us is that we got to act quicker. We got to, be smarter. We got to be as cost effective and as efficient. And in yeah. terms of the expectations of the incoming resident, uh, there is no change in terms of yeah. how they expect that unit to be in versus the time yes. that we had in the past. So yeah. I think from a rental side, that that is a tremendous amount of pressure um, that we have when it comes to kind of the market conditions that we're we're, we're in today. Yeah. Do you, is there, is there on the other, on the other side of things, just in the tenant spaces, do you, is there any other pressure that you see from, from that perspective, just on the pressure of supply and whatnot? To, like, how does that affect your, your property manager's day-to-day -day activity? Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, like I said, I mean, you know, it's um, with, with, with the property managers in itself, again, on the rental space, when you talk about, you know, filling up these units as, as quickly as we are, um, you know, it's making sure that we mobilize our, our vendors and our, and our partners much quicker. Um, yes. Of course, they've got, you know, and I'm sure you you can attest to this. You know, there's there's more of that demand for your service to yeah. do more back to backs on the first yeah. of the month or at the end of the yeah. month um, that you had when we were in a, con, you know, in a market condition of seven, eight, nine, ten percent vacancies. Yeah. Um, so, you know, being able to really lean into the relationships um, that we have in order yeah. to kind of get that first priority to say, hey, look, like we've been in business for X amount of years and, you know, we've got 30 units that need to be turned over, like in the next 48 hours, those yeah. relationships matter, right? Yes. And and if you don't have those relationships, I mean, it's it's kind of unfortunate, but it's, you know, take take a take a, take a, take a ticket in, in, the, in the line, in the long line of yeah. who's next to serve, right? Yeah, holy cow. Are, are you seeing that, uh, are, are condos generally being more price sensitive uh, because of inflation, you know, let, like being more restrictive on the budgets, um, more aware of what they're spending? Is, is that something you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even it, it certainly has put their operating expenses on again on uh, both from the condominium board of directors and even our yeah. rental investors. I mean, yeah. the the microscope is definitely on mm -hmm. with respect to operating expenses, and you're always looking at kind of the biggest ticket items, yes. um, right? And and two areas that in the past seem to be controllable, mm -hmm. whereas where we're at now sometimes uncontrollable, particularly on the utility side. So ensuring yes. that you're you're strategic and you're timely in, in, in fixing yeah. and, and, and um, negotiating contracts on that front. Um, yeah. But certainly there's, there's much more scrutiny now, particularly on the operating expenses, just kind of given the high inflationary conditions yeah. that we're in. And I think, you know, moving forward as, as inflation, it hopefully starts to kind of subside a little bit. Yeah. Um, it's a good practice. I mean, at the yes. end of the day, they're, they're responsible for multi-million dollar assets and that being of yeah. course our board of directors and, and um, you know our investors on the rental side, and, and I think it's just great practice and cadence to um, be able to you know look at the operating expenses, look at you know where are there are synergies and opportunities to enhance your your expenses, um, and that's through again building relationships with great vendors um, or finding ways to automate processes. Through your point earlier around technology, um, yeah. and even on the revenue side, finding ways to create revenue opportunities and ancillary opportunities, yeah. and whatever that yeah. case may be. So. You know, they've, they've certainly created, you know, this environment where yeah. it is scrutiny to, to the max, which, yeah. which is certainly an important thing. Yeah, incredible. Uh, you know, as a leader in the property management world, you know, what, what advice would you give to aspiring property managers looking to climb the ranks, you know, like yourself and achieve similar levels of success? Yeah. Um, you know, I would say embrace the bad. And, um, you know, in, in our industry, and, and, and I'm sure, you know, for the folks that you'll, you'll be speaking with, I think we all can attest that if we don't have problems to solve, well, yeah. 
we really don't have a whole lot of work to yeah. be performing, right? Right. And so you can only imagine the day in, day out of, you know, Mrs. So and so, Mr. So and so, with the dissatisfaction that they have with the problem that they need us to solve. Yes. And more often than not, there's more bads than there are goods. Yeah. But when there is that glimmer of good, it continues to keep you coming back for more. It's like, yeah. you know, you, you, uh, you, I don't know if you play golf. I play a little bit of golf, but I'm no, terrible, but it's that, but it's that <laughs> one shot. It's that one hole yeah. out of the 18 yeah. that keeps me coming back. Right. <laughs> but you almost embrace yourself. You almost put yourself yeah. in, a, in a, in a mindset of embrace the bad because without them, you're not going to get the good. And so that would be the advice that I would give to up and comers. Yeah. To, to know that there's going to be more bad than there's good, but they're out of all of that. There's opportunity yeah. to make things better. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a lot of wisdom there, Glenn. I, I know that, you know, when I first started uh, my business for the listeners, I own a janitorial company, you know, every morning I would wake up and be have anxiety of what, what, what's yeah. coming in that, that morning and what were the complaints that, that oh, may come sure. in, you know, and it's just the nature of the business. But, you know, over the years, 13 years in now, you know, you just learn to, embrace the bad and understand that it's it, it's the nature of the business but what we came to understand and i'm sure you you know this too is it's how you respond right yeah. and it's how you how you react and um and and, and, and it, it, at first it, like i see the new the new managers that we hire and yeah it, they, they it causes them a lot of stress to get overwhelmed with the complaints and it really really just kind of paralyzes them yeah your philosophy is very wise and I think, and I think that's just it, right? And I think as leaders, we have a responsibility to support our folks mm -hmm. through that adversity because, again, it's the way that we have to react and respond to it. And I believe that yeah. it's reinforcing what our purpose is. And if yes. you can just continue to instill what our purpose is, and that's serving yeah. uh, these individuals and their most yeah. important asset, arguably yeah. their most important asset in their lifetime. Yeah. I think if you can reinforce that, you can get folks out of that tough time and respond yes. in a way where it's like, okay, what I'm going through right now is so that I can solve somebody's problem. Like what a great yeah. feeling at the end of yeah. the day, right? Like yeah. somebody that calls us yelling and screaming and this yeah. and that at the end of that call, if we can turn that whole situation yeah. to solving their problem and having a big fat thank you at the end, Oh, yeah. it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing feeling. It's like hitting that one great hole out of the totally. 18 holes in golf. Totally. Right. Beautiful. Beautifully said. That's awesome. Um, can you, can you share a particularly challenging property management situation that you faced or maybe one of your team members faced and you had to kind of manage them through it? And, and how did you effectively resolve it? You know, I don't have any specific examples, Jared, that I'm, I'm going to share with you, but I just That's think, okay. you know, I think it's going to be really back to managing expectations. And, and when yeah. you don't manage those expectations, how you, um, you know, uh, address it with humility and mm -hmm. how you own the situation. Because there's a lot yeah. of instances where, with positive intent, we just want to solve your problems. As managers, yeah. we want to do, 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 do. And yeah. sometimes, you know, we do things that we probably shouldn't be doing. And mm. it puts us in a situation where there's unintended consequences, right? So there's instances where like, ugh, if we had only stuck to our scope of work that we were contracted for, right? you know, it wouldn't have created this situation where there's an expectation where it's unattainable. Right. Now we have to go in there with some humility and say, oh, I'm really sorry that I yeah. just tried to do my very best to build relationships and be positive and all these things. Yes. But the unintended consequence is that we can't attain this in a sustainable way. Yeah. You know, I think about our industry manager and staff turnover. I mean, that is probably what, you know, any owner would be losing sleep at night on. How do right. I retain the best people and how do I attract the yeah. best people? And yeah. I don't think it's a matter of if, it's a matter of when you turn. Yeah, and yeah. In, in a volume business that we manage, right, it's important that we maintain a consistency of expectations for our clients. Because if I have client A that's being managed by, you know, Mr. Joe Smith, and he's doing a bunch of things that are fantastic, but are outside of our scope, yeah. Mr. Joe yeah. Smith then quits, retires, he wins a million dollars, and yeah. then Miss Susan Robinson comes in. Mm -hmm. and sticks to the scope of our agreement. Well, yeah. there's a little bit of a misalignment of expectations there, yeah. right? And so I think managing those expectations is so important in the beginning. And when mm -hmm. you don't, um, you know, having to address it with humility um, to be able to kind of readdress, I think that's going to be key. It's amazing. Tell, tell me a little bit more about that um, as far as, you know, retaining, finding and retaining the, yeah. the, the, you know, the best property management, you know, in, in, in the industry, 
Um, what are some of your strategies for that? For I guess I guess that's two big components. First, finding them, yeah, and then and then and then retaining them and keeping a culture that they want to stay in. Absolutely. Proud of. Well, I think I think the latter. I mean, first and foremost, we have to you know create a culture where people really believe that this is a great place to work, yeah. and yeah. <clears throat> that they want to come into the office, um, yes. you know, because they're proud to serve our customers, and and yeah. equally, if not more importantly, they're proud to serve one another. Yes. Um, we've got a manager bullpen, you know, with an extensive amount of experience, yeah. and you know, through that bullpen are some of those you know, moments where there was a tough situation that they needed, you know, an ear um, to, 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 to listen to, or, you know, somebody with a lot of operational wisdom to provide them with that level of support. Yeah. Um, so really our job is to create this culture where people feel like this is really a, a great place to work. Right. Yes. And I think yes. from a retention standpoint, I think that's, that's, that's critically important. And from, from an attraction standpoint, um, you know, being able to really articulate and differentiate what we can offer, um, yep. as, as an employer. And I think, yeah. you know, um, with, with the resources that, you know, we can offer and, and kind of that best practice and, and, and our, our expertise that we can provide as growth and development opportunities for anybody that's coming in. Yeah. Um, you know, I think are, are a couple of, you know, key ingredients for anybody to, to, at least take a look at, you know, whether or not, you know, first service residential is the right company for them. Yeah. Amazing. Um, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you guys have a real advantage being the size that you are that there, I imagine there are a lot of opportunities for property managers to move up, get, get bigger properties, get, get a, a significant experience under their belt. Yeah. Um, have you seen a lot of those success stories within, within your business? Yeah. I mean, I think even Outside of kind of that property manager team, you know, we've got a team of administrative folks that provide a lot of important services to our ownership, yes. you know, and has served as, you know, a great stomping ground for them to kind of learn the business mm -hmm. as much as they possibly can and, and yeah. you know, kind of be afforded that opportunity and being in the environment to learn a little bit more than they would um, you know, with their competing counterparts. And so, yeah. you know, we've certainly seen some movement internally um, and sticking to kind of property management. You, 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 you made the point around, you know, being able to have the opportunity of managing different complexities and different types of assets. Yeah. You know, we've got assets from, you know, 12 to 16 unit communities to, right. you know, to um, a twin tower high rise, um, you know, a, a, a mixed unit development, so to speak, right? And everything in between. So, yes. you know, it really gives them that that chance to kind of aspire in, in looking at, well, my portfolio currently consists of this asset, these types yeah. of assets, and yeah. wouldn't it be great to be able to manage some of those high rises, you know, in, 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 the, in the next couple of years or whatnot? Yeah, amazing. Very cool. Um, I have to ask the question uh, because I do own a janitorial company, so I always have the sure. one question in here. No problem. Um, so yeah, so assuming janitorial is you know one of your largest ongoing costs in your properties, um, how do you look for janitorial companies to work with, and you know what qualities in the companies are you looking for? Yeah, yeah. you know I think similarly in what kind of you know points and sentiments that I've already made throughout the throughout the conversation, you know Jared is somebody that's reliable, um, you know a group that shares similar values um, of that of, of first service residential, okay. um, you know, being clear with the expectations and, and when things go aside, being accountable and taking yeah. ownership and, and, yep. and, 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 you know, addressing it as, as best as we possibly can and managing all of the different stakeholders, because at the sure. end of the day, you know, we, we look at our vendors as partners. I mean, we're yeah. serving our mutual clients. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, I think from a characteristic standpoint, it's it's certainly, you know, sharing those same values that we have, yeah. but knowing yeah. that we're basically on the same team, we're, yes. <laughs> we're, we're yeah. on the same team. And if we can yes. get aligned and, and partnered in that way, you know, those are the types of vendor partnerships that we, um, you know, we'd like to look for. Beautiful. Beautiful. Awesome. Um, this is a kind of more fun one. So if you, if you can manage any famous property mm. in the world, which one would it be and why? Um, I got to say the United Center in Chicago. Oh um, yeah, yeah, I um, love it. Yeah, Michael Jordan is you know he's he's my all time fave. Um, yeah. not just not just greatest of all time in basketball, but you know somebody to aspire to be, and uh, you know and in, inspired in terms of you know where he had 
what he was able to accomplish even after his basketball career. But yeah. if I if I can manage the United Center during its heydays in, in the yeah. you know early in the late nineties, oh yeah. man, that would be that would be super cool. I, I I really love that as a as a huge basketball fan myself and a Michael yeah. Jordan fan. My my son is named Michael. Um, okay. I, yeah, after a few different Michaels, but Michael Jordan's definitely one of them. Um, and uh, yeah, I love. I love that. Great, great, great decision on that property. My, uh, I have three daughters, and my my middle uh, Sadie's her first name, and her middle name is Jordan, but spelled with a Y. <laughs> but it's for Jordan. So we actually we almost <laughs> named our second child Jordan with a Y. It's is a girl. Right? Yeah, my wife wouldn't let me, but I I tried. I tried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I was I was allowed because it was a second name, right? So right. Yes. Yes. Well done. Um, yeah. No. That's that's amazing. I um. I have you been to the United Center before? Have you? Been, did you ever get? To I've been United? outside. I've been outside. I've never been to yeah. a game. My yeah. um. I, I have been given the opportunity a few times actually to um. Uh watch a couple of games out in the um, Madison Square Garden. Oh, yeah. Um, my brother lives out in New York, but unfortunately never had the chance to actually watch a game in the United Center. So. Yeah, that's that's one of my biggest regrets. I've seen LeBron play. I've seen Kobe play. Oh, wow. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I've seen Curry play, and I saw the, the the Raptors. I went to the the finals for game three and four oh, uh, when, cool. in, in 2019 when they won. Oh, wow. Um, wow. But I never saw Michael Jordan play. One of my yeah. biggest regrets. Yeah, no, me, so. no, me neither. I, I got to see Derrick Rose when he was still a bull playing oh, yeah. against the Brooklyn Nets. Oh, yeah. And uh, that team just got moved to Brooklyn probably like the first or second year. That was so that Garnett was, and Pierce. Yeah, and, that's yeah, exactly it was, what it was. It was yeah, that was yeah, really yeah. cool. And then the yeah. Madison Square game that I, I watched was when Melo was still playing, and he was also uh, playing against Derrick Rose. So both okay. instances, I watched the Bulls. So the Bulls but, still have, you know, a tug on my heart, so to speak, but, yeah. you know. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not the same as, you know, the nineties and nineties yeah. version. They need to make a, a trade right now. I think a trade's coming either Zach Levine or DeRozan. I, I think, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't that be crazy that Zach Levine goes so over to the Raptors? Yeah. Right. right. Uh, yeah. That could be interesting. <laughs> yeah. That would be, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, our listeners don't want to hear our battle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so, so back to, back to this. So, um, you know, if you could recommend, and, and by the way, I want to recommend a book to you now that I know you're a big Michael Jordan mm. fan, but if you can recommend any book to property managers, aspiring property managers, you know, what, what mm. would you recommend? I'm looking at my, uh, list of books here. The monk that sold his Ferrari by Robin Sharma. Uh, huh. Uh, -huh. I've had that recommended to me before actually. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, 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 I would say it's less for property managers, but just, you know, being a grateful human being. Yeah. And yeah. I think it just, you know, offers such a wisdom around how important it is to forever hold a mindset of gratitude. Yeah. Um, it just does so many things for you, right? Especially yeah. through times of adversity. Um, mm. you, you resolve when you're grateful and you, yeah. res you resolve when there's that, you know, never ending attitude of gratitude. So, you know, wow. that, 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 uh, the monk that sold his Ferrari, I got to tell you, Whew. It's a good yeah. one. You're really okay. I'm putting yeah. it on my list. I it's appreciate that. Amazing. Yeah. I want to recommend a book to you and, and listeners to uh, Tim Grover, who is a personal trainer of Michael yep. Jordan and Kobe Bryant. Yep. Have you read Relentless or Winning? I haven't read that book, but I'm aware of Tim Grover. Yeah, yeah, incredible. Both he wrote two, Relentless and Winning, and okay. both get get in the mindset of you know truly achieving what it's like to achieve greatness. You know, wow, and he okay. trained both Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. And really studied the mind frame of you know what it took to you know get to the absolute top that that point zero 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 one percent you know in the world. Uh, cool. Anyways, I highly write. I think you'll love both of those. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll put that great. on my list as well, man. Yeah. Perfect. Um. Finally, Glenn. Um. How can uh, people get a hold of you or or um you know follow you or you know where do you recommend they go? Yeah. You know you can follow myself and and First Service Residential on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, and you can check us out on our website, fsresidential.com slash Alberta. Yes. But uh, other than that, I appreciate you having me on though. Yeah. Thank you so much, Glenn. I, I really appreciate it as well. It was a lot of fun.